So 24 sensational iDevice tips. Sometimes you might think uh, I would just show you iPhone or tablet, but we've decided to kind of combine them all into one place because many of the things that you can do on the phone, you can do on your tablet. So let's get started on that. Let's talk first about some productivity things. So one of the, the first things that I want to talk about is how do you quickly turn off your sound? You know, there you are in church or the theater or wherever it is that you need to be quiet. And a lot of times I see people holding down the volume button until it goes all the way down. And that's certainly one way of doing it. But all you have to do is swipe up from the bottom of your device and you're going to see a whole bunch of quick settings including turning on and off your Wi-Fi, turning your sound, going into airplane mode. This is the way you do it when you're sitting there on the plane and they give you that last two-minute warning that you need to turn off uh, or turn off your device or at least put it into airplane mode. Uh, often these days when you go into airplane mode, you'll want to leave your Wi-Fi on or turn it back on because airplane mode turns that off. But when you tap on your Wi-Fi, you'll put that back on because I know many of the planes these days uh, allow you to use in uh, your Wi-Fi while you're flying. Okay, that was one tip. Uh, another tip is I see how cluttered people's screens are. Oh my gosh, they have so many apps. And apps are great. But one of the things you might want to think about doing is creating folders for apps that are similar to to one another. So if you do a bunch of games, instead of having a separate app icon on your device for the games, what you would do is combine all those games into one folder or group. Each group can hold nine apps. And the way that you do that is, as you know, or perhaps know, to move one of your apps, you hold your finger down on the app until it starts wiggling around. And then once it's wiggling, you drag one app on top of the other app and then just release your finger. And what you'll find is that a folder has been formed and those two apps then are in that folder. You continue dragging all of your apps into the appropriate folders and when you're finished, then of course you hit the home button to get everybody stop wiggling around. So all of a sudden, you've got considerably fewer apps on your screen. That's a much more efficient place to go. In order to access these apps, of course, you would just tap on one of these folders. Up would come the window that shows you all of the individual apps in there. And then you just tap on the one that you want to launch. So really is a little bit easier than... Uh, trying to search for your very popular items. Certainly, you might want to think about putting all of your camera things together, your camera and pictures and so forth. Okay, so this is just uh, showing you a group of um, apps in their folders. Okay, the docking. You know across the bottom of your screen, whether it's your tablet or your phone, you only have a limited number of places for apps. Well, think about now that you've created all of those folders, think about taking one of those folders or two of those folders and dragging it down onto your docking area at the bottom. If you have to make some room to get something off there, just again, hold your finger down on any one of the items on the dock and flick it off the screen or, or move it back onto the screen. And it will create a spot for you where you can now drag one of your newly created folders and ta-da, you've increased the number of items that you can have on your docking station. This is kind of funny, talking and not having anybody uh, talk back to me. Hmm, for 45 minutes, this should be good. Okay, um, this is an important one. Every time I'm teaching, when I have people double tap the home button, you know the home button is that uh, large button at the bottom of your screen. When you double tap the home button, it allows you to see all of the apps that you currently have running because you know how you open an app. You tap on it, it opens, you've played the game, you've gotten through the map, you've done whatever it is that you do, you tap the home button and you open something else. Well, that last app that you had open is still running. 
It doesn't take up much memory. According to Apple, it actually takes up no battery, but it's still cluttery and it really is, it should be monitored. So pretty much at the end of every day, I double tap the home button and it shows me looking left to right and I can scroll just by uh, swiping left or right. I can see all of the apps that I have open. If I don't need an app open any longer, then you just put your finger on the middle of that uh, thumbnail screen and flick your finger up off the top of the screen and that app now, now closes. So it's a little bit better for it to be closing apps all the time rather than leaving them open. All right, your phone rings. Mm, maybe it's not a great time for you to be answering the phone. Maybe you have your phone muted and maybe you're in a meeting and you really can't answer the phone. So you really have two options at the bottom, right? Decline or answer. And so you would normally use one or the other. But there's a third option there over on the right side. And so when you see an incoming um, phone call, you can swipe up that little phone button. And when you do so, another screen will appear at the bottom, allowing you to reply with a message or remind me later. So reply with a message is the one that we're going to look at right now. Well, what kind of a message would that be? Well, the message is one that you have already uh, in reserve. So on mine, I have working with a client, call you back in a couple of hours. It's just a way of sending a text message to that individual that's calling you. The message is declined, of course, when you do this with them with the message, the phone uh, call is declined, but you are now sending a text message back to that individual. So you can see on the screen, when I leave, when I get home, what's up? Those are ones that came by default with your phone. Uh, you can just tap on any one of those and that message has gone out. But do you see where it also says custom, although this wouldn't be the time for you to stop and create a custom message, you can access this custom message from here. And just in the next slide, I'll show you where you can predefine these custom messages. So now you're answering a phone call with a message. If you wanted to set these messages up ahead of time, you would go into your settings, of course, and look for phone, and then respond with text. Now, of course, you can't do this on your tablet, but this will help you with your phone and having a little bit better form of communication. Next up is email. On both devices, you're probably doing a fair amount of emailing. Let's see what we can do to help you make your emailing experience a little bit better. You know, I'd like to think, that the up arrow on your keyboard is the shift key. So when you tap it and you next tap your next character letter, the, it will be in uppercase. And that's all good. But suppose you wanted to emphasize a word. Suppose you wanted to say, that's wonderful. And you actually wanted the entire word wonderful to be in uppercase. What you would do is, before you type your W, you would double tap that up arrow that puts the shift key in a locked position, and now you type the word wonderful. When you're finished with the word wonderful, you tap that uh, shift key again, and now you're in regular lowercase. Uh, how that arrow looks is a little bit hard to say because the different keyboards have a different um, presentation for it, but it will change in a way that you will know that your shift key is on. All right, what else can we do? Well, there's special punctuation. that I find that the uh, keyboard is a little limiting. Certainly gives me my 26 letters, but very few other additional items. So I know that when I'm typing contractions, it's kind of annoying because there is no apostrophe. But the truth is there really is an apostrophe. If you hold down on the comma and exclamation key, you will see that an alternate key is there as well. 
and that's the apostrophe. So you would slide up to the apostrophe, and now you will get an apostrophe in there. If you wanted to do quotation marks, as you can see on the graphic, you would hold down the question mark or the period key, and that would then display a quotation mark. So you probably have been avoiding these because they're really kind of annoying or hoping that it auto-corrects for you, but now you know where the apostrophe and the um, quotation mark symbol is. In addition to those, there is on, under uh, all of the vowel keys, the A, E, I, O, and U, under all the vowel keys, there are special accented vowels. And again, if you hold down your finger on any of these characters, you will see your alternate keyboard. You'll be able to then slide across to the appropriate key that you're trying to insert and then release. This is going to make it easy for when you're typing the word resume or any other uh, key or any other word that would benefit from an accent mark. If you uh, hit the shift key before you do this, of course, you're going to be getting those characters in uppercase. In addition to the regular uh, foreign character, the regular vowel keys, there are some consonant keys, such as the N key. Uh, if we're doing some Spanish typing and we wanted an Enya on that, we would hold down on the N key and it would present itself. In addition to that, the dollar sign key, if you hold it down, will give you other currencies. So if you're uh, typing something relative to the English pound or the euro, there's where you get those characters. And some of the number keys on some of the keyboards, I have to emphasize both of those, uh, will display fractions if you hold down your finger on the keys. I also should say, uh, before we go on, you may find that some of these are not available on your device. It really depends upon how old your device is and, of course, which device you're using. So look for them and don't be disappointed if you don't have them, but you should have most of these. Emojis. I'm sure most of you have your emojis set up. Certainly, if you have grandchildren, they've, they've pressured you into coming into uh, the current uh, sense of we need to display emotions in addition to words. So if you decide that you'd like to insert some emojis in your uh, communications, what I'd like you to do is go to settings in general and keyboard and add new keyboard. This keyboard is actually installed already by Apple. It's a, installed in the, in the sense that it's available, but it actually is not always installed on the keyboard itself. So you have to go in here, add new keyboard, choose the emoji keyboard, and that will now be available to you on any keyboard. You'll find it on the keyboard by looking for the globe. Sometimes it also has a smiley face, but you, more universally, <clears throat> oh, excuse me, more universally, it looks like a globe. Every time you send out an email, whether it's from your iPhone or your iPad, it has a signature automatically. It says, send from I, my iPhone. And if you don't mind that, then that's all good. But I don't really feel like advertising to everyone what kind of a phone I have. So I went in and changed my signature. Also, if you have a business, you really need to think about your signature as being your business card. So one of the things that I have on mine is my name and then computer coach. It's a reminder every time I send out an email to whomever I'm sending it out to that I am a computer coach. You need coaching, you call me. So if you wanted to edit the signature, just go again into your settings, mail, contacts and calendars, and signature. As you can see, some people have come up with some clever examples. A friend of mine always used typed on keys way too small because he's got big clunky fingers and makes a lot of typos. So that's to apologize right up front. Uh, send from a treehouse built for cats by cats. I, I'm telling you, I found this on the internet, so it must be true that somebody actually puts that on there. Telepathically transmitted from my space cloud hovering above Xanar. I don't even know what that means, but I thought it looked kind of interesting, so I included it in here. Just make your signature your own. Maybe it's just as simple as your name, that you don't have to sign your name at the end of everything. 
Just a thought. Okay, text shortcuts. Uh, when you're writing either an email or a text message uh, or uh, a note in the notepad, you can have pre-programmed certain characters that when you type those characters, they change to something longer. So in this example, in these programs, you would type IDK, and that would change to I don't know, or TTYL for talk to you later, or OTL for on the links if you're a golfer, uh, or whatever it is that you do for, for relaxation, you might want to create a shortcut so that when you're texting somebody, you can give them a quick text answer. You also might think about using something like the AA, the at signs, uh, for your email account. So the way that you do this is that you go into your settings in general and keyboard. We've been there before. But now we would choose Add New Shortcut. Once you chose Add New Shortcut, another window comes up, allowing you to put in a phrase and a shortcut. Now, I always find this to be a little confusing because I think it should be reversed. I think they should give you the opportunity to type the shortcut first and then the phrase that will be inserted, but they don't always listen to my emails clearly. So the shortcut is what you're willing to type in the message or the email. And then the phrase is what is going to be replaced by it. So this actually is kind of a long shortcut. Uh, you know, I think uh, something shorter and more memorable. Uh, don't make it too difficult. Don't use upper and lowercase characters for the shortcut. But you can, in the phrase, use upper or lowercase characters if you'd like. All right, moving on. Uh, saving a message as a draft. This is an email message that we're still talking about. So you'd started a message and maybe you were called away, maybe you ran out of time. Oh, you're going to lose that whole message. Well, not so much. When you tap cancel while you're composing the email message, it will say, oh, do you want to save draft? Or it may just say the word save. And you'll indicate, yes, you want to save it. So that then gets saved in your drafts folder. And you can access your drafts folder in a couple of ways. One of the easiest ways, I'm sure that you know about going up to the mailboxes at the top and tapping on that and scrolling over and finding the drafts folder. But the easiest way is just hold down the compose icon. The compose icon, you see where the arrow, the red arrow is pointing at the bottom. That's the compose icon. And if you hold your finger down on it, another window will appear with all of your drafts. You'll be able to slide over to the appropriate draft and tap on it and continue editing it. So look at that. That's a real easy way to find your drafts, much easier than checking into your various mailboxes. All right, if you wanted to delete multiple messages, so you're doing triage on your email, and I certainly recommend doing that. Go through and first just delete all of the emails that you think you're not going to be interested in. So you would tap edit. You go into your inbox, of course, and you would tap edit. And uh, once you tap edit, you'll be in a mode where you'll be able to tap all of the emails individually, and then you'll be able to tap delete. So this is what it looks like once you tap on edit. You get little circles to the left of each of your emails. You'll be able to click, click, click on them and then delete them all in one fell swoop. Look at this poor person has 157 unread emails in their inbox. I hope that's not you. You should have a goal of about 25 emails in your inbox because the reality is that anything that's further down than that, you probably won't get to it and forget about it, and it hasn't been taken care of. So that's a goal that I always like to tell my clients. Let's try and keep you lean and mean on your inbox. Using dictation. This one is fun. <laughs> but a woman came up to re me recently after I 
made this presentation and she said I, I went in here and I can't turn my microphone on and I looked at her phone and it was a sad old phone and didn't have a microphone on it so there's no way she was going to turn this on but uh, if you have a microphone available you want to make sure that Siri is turned on just by going into settings in general in Siri and uh, what you'll find is that once you turn that on, you will now have a microphone on all of your keyboards. So whether you're texting somebody, you don't actually have to text by tap, tap, tapping your characters. You can text by talking into the microphone. If you want to send an email, again, same thing. So once it's turned on, you'll see that on your keyboard, you have a microphone. And you'll be able to tap that microphone and start dictating. Once you're finished, you'll tap on either done or pause. Having said that, here's a couple of tips that you need to know. One is <laughs> I, I really recommend that you don't look at the screen while you're talking. And the reason for that is it's really so funny to watch people when they're doing it, especially when they're kind of new at this. When you're a little bit more experienced, you can probably look at the screen. But people expect that as they're saying a word, the word is instantly appearing on the screen. And that's really not the way it works. It's taking a phrase into consideration and then putting the phrase in all at once. So if I were to uh, start dictating and I said, today is a beautiful day in Florida. If I looked at my screen, I probably for a moment wouldn't see anything. And then suddenly I'd see that entire phrase go into the screen. So sometimes people say, today is a beautiful day in Florida. Wait, why isn't it typing the keys? Why, why are the words not appearing? Okay, well, suddenly you got a lot of words that you didn't intend to have in there. So don't look at the screen while you're, when you're beginning doing it. Maybe you can do that a little bit later. Also, speak clearly, but don't emphasize or overemphasize something. I've often heard people say, all right, now, today, there's a, the sun is out and Okay, that's just a little bit too much emphasis. Let's just talk normally in this. She understands English. Don't say too much. So just use a phrase or two or stop halfway through the sentence. Just give it a little pause. It will make it easier for her to catch up with you and also make it easier for you to make sure that the direction that the sentence is going in is the one you wanted. Take advantage of autocorrect. Uh, one of the reasons that it lags behind you is because it wants to know which weather are you talking about. Won't know which weather until you talk about the sun or, or the rain, and then it will put in the correct weather. So that's one example of autocorrect. And if you're going to put in punctuation, you have to say the punctuation. If you want it to add a comma, you have to say the word comma or period or hyphen or most importantly, new paragraph. You often have to say new paragraph twice because uh, just like on a keyboard, you often like to hit new paragraph twice so that there's extra space between the paragraphs. And here is a biggie, of course. Everybody needs to proofread what they dictate. It often is not perfect the first time. Okay, let's talk about another part of your device, and this is the camera. This is probably my absolute favorite part of it. Okay, let's... Uh, uh, talk about autofocus. You know that when you hold up your camera and take a picture, it has autofocused on some aspect of that picture. Uh, lately, we've been seeing that it puts boxes around people's faces to let you know that that's what it's focusing on, and that's okay. But I took this picture from my desk, and I get to sit at my desk and look at the pool and look at all the palm trees and outside. It's really quite delightful. But what you can see in this picture is off to the left, there's a lamp. Maybe you can see it very faintly. Maybe I wanted to take a picture of that lamp. Well, what I needed to do before I took the picture was I needed to tap on that lamp in the picture, and it changed the light source. It changed the way it was viewing the light and using the light. So you can see the two pictures are very different, but now sitting in the very same place, two seconds apart, I was able to take a picture of that unattractive lamp. So uh, think about 
often when you're outside and somebody is in deep shade, you might want to tap on them and change the emphasis of the light. You also might consider putting your flash on as well. Even though it's bright daylight, the flash will help to mitigate the um, shadow. Okay, taking a selfie. You see people doing this all the time. It's really quite a hoot to watch. But if you haven't ever taken a selfie, the way that you do it is you, in your camera, look for the little picture of the camera with a circle around it or within it. There's a couple of icons that are being used. So I'm not sure which one is being used on your device, but you'd open the camera, you tap to switch the, to a front-facing camera, you have to be prepared for what you see because often you're frowning into your camera. So you're not going to see a pretty picture, but just be careful. Uh, don't take a picture of that and adjust your face and then tap the shutter to take a picture. When you're taking a selfie, it's often not a bad idea, especially with a group. We were doing this the other day to turn on your uh, a timer to turn on the timer because it's, it will allow you either three or 10 seconds to get everybody in the picture and get everybody smiling at the same time. So the way that you do this is across the top of your camera app, it has a little um, clock on it. And when you tap on that, it, you'll be able to choose either 10 seconds or three seconds. There will be a countdown on your screen once you tap that. So from 10 down through one, and finally it will take the picture. This is really helpful when you're with a group and, uh, and it takes a while for you to get yourself organized. So check out that timer. Uh, note that HDR auto at the top of your screen, because I'm gonna talk about that in a second. And that's where it is. A lot of time people are looking elsewhere. Okay, panoramic mode. This is really fabulous. So there you are at the Grand Canyon and the vista is amazing. And you take a picture from the left and from the center and from the right. But what you really want is the pano mode. So again, you're in your camera, you see the various modes across the bottom. A lot of times people are trying to move the shutter, the white uh, circle, they're trying to move that left or right. That doesn't move. What you're trying to do is move the choices above it. So you move pano until it is over the shutter. And then you're going to position your camera and tap the shutter to start the picture. At that moment, you're gently, slowly moving your camera from left to right. And specifically, I mean from left to right. On the iPhone and iDevices, it is assuming that you are taking the picture from left to right. So you start with your camera already positioned on the left side of what you're going to be taking. You hit the shutter to get started on that. And now you're slowly moving to the right. When you're finished, you tap the shutter again, and it will assemble all those pictures that it took while it was rotating into one fabulous picture. Now, you want to be careful that you, you know, can only go so many degrees uh, before you're going to start having distortion. But you should be able to get a good segment of the Grand Canyon or, or the mountains or whatever it is that you're trying to take a picture of. You should be able to get a good section in that. Now, as I said, it is assumed that the picture is going from left to right. If you felt that you wanted to take it from right to left, then you just tap the arrow, the right-facing arrow that's on the left side of your screen. You tap that, and it zooms over to the right side. And now when you move your camera, you'll need to move your camera from the right to the left. And most times, it probably doesn't make much difference which one you use, but suppose you were going from a very light uh, part of the sky to the dark part. You probably want to start on the light side so that your auto shutter is in the correct, um, is allowing the correct amount of light to come in. If you start on the dark side, it may get too dark coming over to the light and, and vice versa. So uh, that's why you would, might want to go from one side uh, versus the other. 
And you can do vertical pan panorama. This is a little uh, counterintuitive in that once you open up your camera, you have to turn your camera so that it is in the horizontal orientation, and then you'll be able to shoot the panorama from the bottom up. So there you are at the base of the Empire State Building or the Statue of Liberty, and you wanted to take one of those great pictures of the height of it. Well, you can do that. You'll just need to turn your camera around and shoot it from the bottom up. There is no turning this one around. You can't shoot it from the top down. It's only a bottom up thing. And when you're finished, tap done. All right. The burst mode. I love this burst mode. I'll have to show you in a second. I will show you in a second some pictures that I took. But be careful. Uh, there are some people in my family that when whenever they take a picture, they are in burst mode because they don't recognize it. So their camera is cluttered up with seven or eight or ten of the same pictures. So you just hold the shutter down because when normally when you're taking a picture, it's a tap. It is not a hold. It's a simple tap and you take one picture. But if you hold the shutter down, it's going to continue to take pictures until you release that shutter. And here's a sequence that we took. We were in, let's see, where is that? Here it is. We were in Colombia, and this very brave guide is there with a crocodile, and he's feeding him some fish. And I wanted to get just that perfect picture. Well, where is that perfect picture? Well, there it is. But it, it, I probably would have missed it if this was not in burst mode. Once you're finished with the pictures, you can just delete the ones that you don't want. Actually, within the Photos um, app, app at this point, I believe what you do is identify the pictures that you do want to keep, and then when you hit delete, it will delete the balance of them. I think if you're looking for a job and you're in the Columbia area, you could probably have this job pretty soon because I have to think that this crocodile is going to say any moment. So all I got was that stinking piece of fish, but look what's next to it. I think I could take some more if I wanted. I don't know. I don't know. Remember I mentioned that HDR setting at the top of your camera? If you have that available, this is what it does. It actually takes two pictures and averages them out. It takes a picture of all of the dark elements and it takes a picture of all the light elements and then it puts them together into that third picture. You can see on your screen, the left and the right pictures were independent pictures and then they were combined automatically by your camera into this third picture. So if you're in a situation where there's very high definition, you might want to do this. Here's a no. Oh, Oh, I thought that was going to give me another example. Sorry. Hmm. Okay. Not, I know I had another one. Well, you get the idea. Okay. Uh, so you, so you want to send some pictures to your friends via email. Well, you want to be careful because you can only send five pictures at a time. These pictures are very large and they take up a lot of room. Uh, in transmission. So you'll be able to select, open your photos app, tap the share option. The share option uh, just says share at the bottom. It might also have any one of these icons that are also sharing. When I work with my seniors, they're often looking at these icons and thinking, that doesn't mean sharing to me, an arrow coming out of a box. But I don't know what you think about it. But that is what is being used to share. So you would tap on share and then you would tap on each of the pictures up to five and then uh, fill in your email message and away they go. Notes. I thought this was a good one to talk about because uh, I take notes all the time. I find that that uh, the old method of saying, oh, that's such a great thing. I'll remember that doesn't work for me anymore. I barely remember having the conversation, let alone what was it that I was supposed to remember. So I use the app, the notes app a lot. Uh, I launch the note app and remember those shortcuts that we created before. Uh, you can use those shortcuts in your notes if you want. So you tap on the new option, it says the word new, and then you just tap in your note and start uh, writing or 
if you've turned on your microphone, start speaking. The first line of the note becomes the title because you're going to be able to see all of your notes in a list. So when we're on our vacations and somebody is telling me about a book or somebody is telling me about a, a, an attraction I might want to follow up on, I'll open up my notes and quickly type in or speak in a note. To edit a note, you'll again launch your notes app. And when you launch your notes app, it's going to show you all of your notes. Again, remember, you're uh, looking for the first line of information that you typed in. So you'll be able to tap anywhere on the note that you want to edit and tap anywhere within the note. And the keyboard comes up and you're updating or changing. Deleting a note, real easy to delete a note. Again, open your notes app open the note you want to delete. And once you're looking at the note, you'll be able to see that there is a delete within there. Okay, so uh, talking about some apps, because what good is your device without some apps? Well, here's some apps that not everybody knows about, but are very popular. First one is Skyview Free. This uh, free is the good word on here. This is a really cool app. It allows you to go out in the middle of the night or when it's dark, which should be happening earlier as of tonight, right? We're all changing our clocks unless you live in Arizona. Uh, we're gonna be changing our clocks so it will be er easier for you to use this. What you do is go out at night, you point it at the night sky, open up your app or vice versa, open up your app and point it at the sky, and it's going to show you all the constellations and you'll be able to figure out which ones are which. It, it has lines that are drawn from constellation, within the constellation, because I don't know about you, but I used to look at the sky, I can see the Big Dipper. Okay, I can see the Little Dipper and the North Star, but beyond that, I never figured out where these things were. So this is a really cool thing, especially if you have kids. They're intrigued by it. Duolingo. Going on a vacation, want to speak a little Spanish or French or German? Download the free Duolingo program, and this is a very painless way for you to learn a new language. I believe it's free. Um, and you'll uh, be able to walk, work through the various, um, uh, the various languages and phrases, and you'll be a pro in no time. Our son had a, um, an, a pair living with them for a year, and she was brushing up on her English by using this. Google Translate, this is really fabulous if you travel. Or if you're perhaps uh, you're at a Chinese restaurant and you wanted to communicate something in Chinese to them. Well, you speak in English, you say translate it to Chinese and it will translate it for you. Uh, it even, as this picture implies, it even will uh, take some, um, a note that you have written in there of characters that you have seen and will translate it. Now, of course, if you're traveling, uh, you want to be careful using this because it does, in fact, use your data when you're traveling. So be a little cautious about that. XE currency, if you're a shopper, this is perfect. Again, it is using your data, so be careful. But if you wanted to find out, you're in the store, and I'm always trying to figure out, oh, what is that in US dollars? And of course, things are changing all the time. So you can say what the current currency is and what that number is, and it will convert it for you to another currency. Love it. <laughs> This one is my husband's favorite. He comes out of all kinds of um, shows and says, Ugh, they move the whole parking lot around. I have no idea where my car is. So find my car is brilliant. You come out of your, you park your car, you hit park car, park here, and you go about your business. When you come out, you say, find my car, and it gives you step-by-step -step directions on where your car is. This is a cool one. If you're concerned about your heart and measuring it, you can measure it from your device. 
what you do is put your finger on the camera and somehow it translates that into a heart rate. Pretty amazing. And now that you know your heart rate, if you think you, you need a little medical assistance, how about a little WebMD? This is kind of a fun app um, that you put in your symptoms and it tells you what your problem is. It's better than uh, some of your uh, local health providers or better than talking to your spouse about it because they'll just uh, say, uh, yeah, it's nothing. Don't worry about it. So. What do you think? 24 sensational eye device tips? I think we have at least 24 in here. Uh, do we have any questions? I'm just, oh, look at that. I have two more minutes to go. Are there any questions? Yes, we do have one. We actually have a couple. Um, do you know what I oh, iOS was installed on the device as shown? Oh, a whole variety of them. It wasn't from one device. Okay, which which iOS do you use on your phone? <laughs> well, that's not a very good question to ask because I actually use an Android phone. Oh, okay. So you would take what were you take using to take the pictures with? Yeah, I would borrow a, a a device from my family members and take it. And I don't, I really don't know which iOS. Oh, okay. Was using. Okay, then the other one question is, what app is the Star Search one? Oh, I had the uh, name of it, Skyview, Skyview Free. Okay. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. Yeah, um, that is the name of it, Skyview yeah. Free. Okay. And there are, there are a couple of others out there. You know, for each of these, there's probably 20 competitors but I just wanted to, to let you know that you could use something like that, that it was available. Okay. Thank you very much. As I said, uh, okay. Okay, the question, do the junk mail folders in the mail app actually train your email program to filter spam? Do they train it? Um, are you saying that if you identify something as spam, does that train the, the email? Because it does, if that was what the question is. I, I was, I'm just reading the question as it was, it was type. Right. I'm assuming do you, if you put something in the junk and market as spam, does the... Uh, is that uh, learned? Does it learn from that? It is learned. Okay. It should be learned. It's sometimes you have to do these things multiple times because there was a guy here in our community who kept falling into my spam, and I kept saying, it's not spam, but I had to do that three or four times before it really worked. Okay. We have, how do I find an on-screen keyboard? Well, a keyboard comes up whenever you're in a function that requires putting text in. So if, if you don't have a keyboard, that means that you don't have anything up on your screen that will allow you to type. So if you're filling in a form, you need to tap in an area where you'd be able to type, and then a keyboard would come up. So if you're in your email, of course, you get a, a keyboard right away. If you're in your notes and you tap on new notes and you tapped within the note itself, a keyboard would appear. So the keyboard only appears when you're in a viable place to type information. Okay, question. Um, are you able to, is, does I, iPhones allow for uh, alternate screen keyboards or you just have, the, just have the one keyboard? You can actually have multiple keyboards. Some of them you might have to purchase. There's one that's very popular. It's a swipe keyboard. So instead of tap, tapping, uh, you know, if you were tapping wood, W-U-L-D, instead of tapping W and then going over to O, you, you start on the W, you swipe across to the next letter, you swipe down, swipe across, and the, that's an additional keyboard that would be available to you. So there are other keyboards. Certainly, there are other language keyboards, too. Okay. The question here. Is there a way to put my MP3s into my iPhone? 
Um, I'm seeing you do through that through iTunes. Yeah. But I, I think what he's saying is I copied lecture CDs to my firewall plug thumb drive. I assume you'd have to run them through uh, iTunes to get them in there. I would think so. I I can't say that I've ever done it, so it would be it would be a Google search for me to find out how you would do that. Okay. He says his iPhone does not show the MP3. Smartphone does. I don't know that much about the iPhone to answer that. Great. Right. Uh, oh. What What did he say? The iPhone. He says the iPhone does not show the MP3s, smartphone does. Right. You know, sometimes when you hook up external devices to your iPhone, you have to look carefully because it is uh, asking how it should handle those external items. So when I hook an iPhone up to a computer, it normally is not recognized until I go back to the iPhone and say, this is okay, this is a computer, I want you to be there as if you were a drive. So it might be something as simple as that. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay, somebody talked about the app is Instaringo. Have I heard of that? I don't know. Instaringo? I I store go. I store and go. No, I don't know. Okay. I have no idea. <laughs> there Maybe that's the app that you have to use. I don't know. Yeah, there are more apps out there than anybody can imagine. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, there are a lot of apps out there, and you just got to try them. Exactly. And most of them are free, or at least they're free to try. And I always, you know, look at the app list and then go to a uh, – a search and say reviews, whatever the app is, and put in the word reviews, and people be very candid about what they like and what they don't like about it. So you don't have yeah. to download it first. Yeah. Uh, even the reviews within the programs are suspect because m many times people will just say good things about it. Yeah. So get out of the app and just do a yeah. search. Well, a lot of it, you got websites, CDNet, and a couple that will review the best, the 10 best uh, iPhone phone apps or the iPhone right. you know, well, camera you, apps and that type of stuff that will help you. You often have to look at where those uh, websites are and what their agenda is because often, you know, they're the company that's making the apps that's reviewing how, how great the, their 10 top are. Yeah, yeah and, the, and the best reviews I've found are from friends. <laughs> right. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. So they're the best doing it. And the, he's trying to say, uh, he said sometimes MP3s work differently on um, IPCs than they do for Macs in different formats. Yeah. And someone suggests to use Wireshare for MP3 transfer for that iTunes. Okay. Well, we're uh, 10 minutes before the hour. We've uh, had a very interesting presentation from Diane. And I want to thank you, Diane. You're welcome. My email address is on the screen. If anybody is interested in contacting me, I'd be happy to reply to any questions directly. And don't forget my book, 100 Amazing Computer Tips.